Right, so today we are going to talk about cardiac tamponade. Already we had a very detailed lecture in the, on the topic of acute pericarditis, right? And uh, now we will talk about cardiac tamponade. Now, what is cardiac tamponade? Let me draw, make a diagram first. Actually, cardiac tamponade is a condition uh, in which fluid is accumulated in pericardial sac under pressure. Under pressure is the real thing. What is there? Fluid is accumulated in the pericardial sac. So this is pericardial effusion. But pericardial effusion exerts so much pressure on the cardiac chambers that it obstructs the inflow of blood to the heart. Right? Let me make it a very simple diagram. Let's suppose here lies your heart. Uh, suppose this is the normal heart with the, it's a very simple diagram. Right? Heart should be simple anyway. Clever hearts have problems. So it's a simple heart. Now, what really happens that uh, if there is fluid in pericardium and, and this fluid in the pericardium develops so much pressure if there is if there is so much pressure that it compresses the heart in such a manner that venous filling is obstructed right for for example here the venous filling is coming right and here there is so much pressure that venous blood cannot be filled in the ventricles properly right or cardiac filling is compromised and of course, if there is fluid accumulated and it builds so much pressure, I am not talking about amount of the fluid, I am talking about the pressure of the fluid, this is very important. If it produces so much pressure that it strangulates the heart, it strangulates the cardiac chambers and intrapericardial pressure is more than the filling pressures in heart. If intrapericardial pressure is more than the filling pressures of the heart, then cardiac filling will be compromised. And you know, heart is a pump. If you cannot fill in, can you get out? So, what really happens that if venous return to the heart is compromised and heart is not filling, then cardiac output will drop. If you are not putting the blood in, from where you will get the blood out? You are getting it. So what really happens that cardiac output will drop and we say that patient's hemodynamic stability will be lost. And when whole this situation develop, we say there is cardiac tamponade. And I want to make it clear. Many times patient has pericardial effusion. But pericardial effusion does not exert enough pressure to strangulate the heart, then it is not tamponade. Listen carefully. If a patient has pericardial effusion, let's suppose this is a, a, another, this patient also develops pericardial effusion, but effusion is a sort of lax, lax effusion. It does not enough pressure to strangulate the heart, then it will be called, called pericardial effusion but it should not be called cardiac tamponade. So what I am trying to tell first of all what is pericardial effusion? Excessive fluid in pericardial sac right normally 30 to 50 ml fluid is there but when there is excessive fluid in pericardial sac we say pericardial effusion is there but every case of pericardial effusion is not cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade is said to be present only when intrapericardial pressures due to effusion become more than the filling pressure in the ventricles and ventricular filling is compromised resulting into hemodynamic instability in the patient. Am I clear? Now, question is this, that uh, this condition, cardiac tamponade, this is medical emergency because hemodynamic situation is not stable, heart is not getting enough blood and it's not maintaining its cardiac output appropriately. It's a medical emergency. So rapid and correct diagnosis is a must. It saves life. Rapid diagnosis and correct diagnosis is a must 
right? If you miss this temporary case, maybe you will be losing the patient. You are getting it? This is one cause of shock which is treatable. Cardiac tamponade is one cause of shock which is treatable. Sometimes only just doing the pericardial synthesis can relieve. Later on I will tell you there are few exceptions where you don't do pericardial synthesis in cardiac tamponade. But in most of the patients with cardiac tamponade, if you draw the fluid out, you can relieve the patient at least for a while, depending on the underlying causes. Is that right? So it's a medical emergency, right? It's a one cause of shock which is treatable. That is why I'm stressing so much on this disease. You can save the life with rapid, correct, and prompt, you can say, right diagnosis. Now, so, the question is that, that uh, its diagnosis is clinical, right? Echocardiography is the confirmatory test. Again, I will repeat it. You diagnose this patient on the bedside with signs and symptoms. History, signs and symptoms. A good doctor must be able to make a diagnosis of tamponade. Is that right? Later on, if there is not extreme urgency, you can do the echocardiography and echocardiography can confirm your clinical diagnosis or reject. But that is later on. Is that right? So let's talk about that uh, first of all, how much fluid should be there to produce tamponade? How much pericardial fluid should be there to produce tamponade? Answer is that it is really not the amount of fluid. Actually, it, it, tamponade will be there or not in a patient with pericardial effusion, it depends on three factors, right? Number one, it depends on amount of fluid. Of course, when amount of fluid is more here, pressure will go into pericardial more. But more important than amount is the rapidity with which fluid is accumulated. Rapidity. The rapidity, the speed with which fluid is accumulating. If fluid is accumulating very gradually, if fluid is accumulating very gradually, then pericardium will stretch out. What will happen? Stretch. Pericardium will stretch out. And if pericardium stretches out, then intrapericardial pressure does not raise rapidly. The fluid is accumulating slowly, then pericardium has time to stretch out, right? And if pericardium keeps on stretching out and fluid is accumulating slowly, then intrapericardial pressure will rise very slowly and maybe lot of fluid is accumulated before the tamponade develop, before the hemodynamic instability develop. Sometimes up to 2 liter fluid is accumulated and after that tamponade develop. But, but if fluid is accumulating very rapidly, if fluid is accumulating very rapidly, then pericardium does not have time to stretch out. And if pericardium does not stretch out, there is rapid fluid accumulation, even small amount of fluid like 100 to 200 ml fluid is enough to strangulate your heart. You get it? So what I am saying, this, it is not only the amount, it is all the, also that how fast or slow pericardial effusion is developing. And third factor of course is that compliance, compliance which is a measure of stretchability. If pericardium is very stiff, of course very little fluid will produce the tamponade. But if it is stretchable, then what will happen? Even larger amount of fluid may not raise the pressure so much. So basically, primarily there are three things. How much fluid is there? What is the rate of accumulation of fluid? And what is the compliance? These three factors interact with each other to produce the tamponade. Right? In the end, what matters is not amount. What really matters is intrapericardial pressure. What is that? Intrapericardial pressure. Right? If it is more than 15 millimeter of mercury, it definitely leads to tamponade. Why? Because when pressure here becomes more than 15 millimeter of mercury, it is more than the filling pressures. 
Am I right? So, yeah. And if pressure here is more than 15 millimeter of mercury, tamponade features start developing. Am I clear? Right. Now, let's talk about rapid accumulation of fluid and what are the causes and solo accumulation of fluid and what are the causes. If there is rapid accumulation then what happens? This is sort of acute situation. So cardiac tamponade may be acute or it may be subacute or chronic. Subacute or chronic. In the acute cases there is rapid accumulation and sometimes 100 to 200 ml fluid is enough to produce tamponade. In the subacute or chronic cases, sometimes up to 2 liter, 2000 ml fluid needs to be accumulated before enough pericardial pressure is there to produce tamponade. Am I clear? Now, the causes of acute, very rapidly de developing cardiac tamponade. Yes. Who will tell me the causes of very rapidly developing? tamponade due to some reason very very rapidly fluid is accumulating within the pericardial sac first you should not forget free wall rupture of the ventricles right trauma chest trauma yes very good we can put like stab wound in the chest right rupture of the free wall of the heart and blood definitely pours out into pericardial sac so we can say trauma chest trauma of course right chest trauma leading to rupture of the damage to the coronary artery or damage to the root of the aorta or damage to the free wall of the uh, what is this ventricles or atrium and blood accumulates into pericardial sac that will lead to rapid tamponade other cause other cause of rapid accumulation of fluid is dissection of aorta but before that i would love to mention uh, post mi free wall rupture post myocardial infarction free wall rupture free wall rupture what I really mean that uh, here is your beautiful heart right and unfortunately if someone develop myocardial infarction and here is your pericardium right and if this piece of uh, this area infarcted area you know after a few days of infarction it becomes soft right if this area becomes soft and it ruptures the blood may pour into and this bleeding may accumulate rapidly where in the pericardium right and this accumulation can also lead to tamponade but remember this is one case of tamponade where you will not aspirate the fluid because if you will not do the pericardiosynthesis pericardiosynthesis is a process in which you pass a needle to the pericardium and aspirate the fluid out right here if you aspirate the blood out more blood will come there so this is one contraindication for yes yes pericardiosynthesis because every doctor whenever he think of cardiac tamponade he thinks of you should bring the needle and push it and get everything out that is average doctor good doctor should know that what is the underlying cause maybe myocardial rupture Another cause is dissection of aorta, actually more specifically dissection in the root of aorta, aortic dissection, aortic dissection. Now what really happens in aortic dissection? This is your aorta. Here is your pericardium as you know that uh, pericardium is around all the great vessels of the heart and this is pericardial sac, root of aorta is in the pericardial sac. Now let me make this is aortic valve of course, let me make the aortic uh, wall little thickened, right this is the wall of aorta. Sometimes when there is dissection of aorta, right, uh, for example if there is dissection here, then blood, this is uh, blood, 
blood which should normally travel in the lumen of aorta it punctures the wall of aorta and enters into wall of aorta and then it tracks within the wall it tracks within the wall of aorta if blood enters into wall of the aorta and tracking sometimes this ruptures outward and then blood goes into pericardium let me make more clear diagram that here is aorta okay and i'm just going to make let's suppose this is blood and blood is going right it's a very simple diagram and here is what pericardial sac i have removed the i'm not showing the right right side of heart now what really happens that if there's a tear here and through this tear blood tracks into wall of aorta and it may go anti integrate or it may cut the wall of aorta retrograde and then if it opens outward right blood will come into pericardial sac and very rapidly pericardial sac will be full of blood and of course due to rapid accumulation there's not enough time to stretch out the pericardium so intrapericardial pressure will go up and strangulate the heart and cardiac tamponade will develop but again this is another case of cardiac tamponade in which you will not do pericardio synthesis why because again more blood you spread more blood will come here and patient will go into shock you are understanding me right in such cases where there is free wall rupture or there is uh, aortic dissection right in such cases uh, if by mistake you put a needle there the blood will come out which is br bright red right it is oxygenated blood right secondly it will clot so in both cases post MI yeah right here also you should not do pericardial synthesis here also you should not do pericardial synthesis is that right in this case is uh, the right approach will be while trying to stabilize the patient uh, medically you, you take it uh, for thorough thoracotomy right and an expert cardiologist or cardiac surgeon or cardiothoracic surgeon should deal with the situation right so these are two cases where you should now the question is that that these are acute or very rapidly accumulating fluids like trauma post mi free wall rupture or aortic dissection and if we go for chronic accumulation as i told you gradually developing pericardial effusion uh, which leads to tamponade when there is lot of fluid accumulated up to 1 liter 1 and a half liter or 2 liter right uh, classical example here will be neoplasia and tuberculosis neoplasia and tuberculosis right neoplasia and tuberculosis then there are other causes of cardiac tamponade there are so many causes i will just mention some other important causes of tamponade uh, one more important cause of cardiac tamponade is idiopathic pericarditis idiopathic pericarditis now idiopathic pericarditis is usually not always usually repeated attacks of viral pericarditis and eventually uh, where we cannot find the cause of pericarditis with routine investigation of course sometimes you bring the cia to investigate maybe they will find a reason right but what i'm trying to tell you that with routine investigation if you cannot find the cause of pericarditis uh, usually it is viral we think this is idiopathic pericarditis and some people unfortunately when they repeatedly suffer with idi idiopathic pericarditis uh, they eventually may go into cardiac tamponade or they may go first of course they go into situation of pericardial effusion and then eventually they may end up into pericardial tamponade or some of these patients end up with constrictive pericarditis which we will discuss into next lecture so then, then there are other causes uh, some other causes of bleeding in pericardial sac bleeding in pericardial sac already we have said that bleeding may be due to these three causes like trauma post mi free wall rupture aortic dissection but a very important cause of bleeding in pericardial sac which may lead to tamponade is post cardiac operations 
or post cardiac interventions especially in modern world it is one of the very important group of patients uh, where you have done some sort of cardiac surgery right and after that right uh, bleeding occurs within the pericardial sac and this is a dangerous bleeding because bleeding is occurring into limited space and it will blood will accumulate and again strangulate the heart so bleeding may be traumatic may be free wall rupture may be stab injury but more importantly you must remember that post cardiac operations or post cardiac interventions is that right bleeding can occur cardiac operations then sometimes we have done a big mistake patient with acute pericarditis don't give them anticoagulants patient with acute pericarditis acute pericarditis if you give them anticoagulants they may bleed to death they will bleed into pericardial sac and if not diagnosed in time and managed it will strangulate the heart and lead to tamponade cardiogenic shock and death anticoagulants why i'm trying to put into my students mind that in acute pericarditis be careful to give anticoagulants the reason being sometimes as i mentioned in previous lecture that acute pericarditis present with ischemic like pain even though classically the pain of acute pericarditis is uh, central chest pain which is sharp and stabbing and localized you are getting it but sometimes acute pericarditis pain may be dull and diffuse and pressure like so doctor may confuse this pain as an ischemic pain and give anticoagulant and that may lead to hemorrhagic bleeding in the pericardial sac and rapidly developing tamponade why sometimes as i mentioned in the previous lecture why in acute pericarditis sometimes pain is like myocardial pain not pericardial pain because sometimes in fulminant acute pericardial inflammation right uh, what really happens that uh, chemical mediators of inflammation which are present in the pericardial layers and pericardial sac may diffuse into epimyocardium and lead to inflammation and injury to epimyocardium and if epimyocardium become injured as a part of acute pericarditis that will present a clinical a clinically with a pain uh, which is like myocardial injury pain or dull diffuse and pressure like pain or weight like pain or compressing pain or squeezing pain you know all those pains of heart right okay am i clear then we come to some other causes of uh, pericarditis of course suppurative pericarditis which can lead to suppurative <coughs> pericarditis and if it is not treated and pericardial effusion is not drained right it may lead to tamponade right suppurative pericarditis and then there is something renal failure renal failure renal failure that is uremic pericarditis right uremic pericarditis then that can also end up into what tamponade remember uremic pericarditis may be painful may be painless right but it can also end up into more often can you tell me another pericarditis which can be painless one is uremic pericarditis tell me just one more cause neoplasia yes tuberculosis and neoplasia very good neoplasia tuberculosis we have written here right so these are some other causes of cardiac tamponade but now i will go to clinical presentation which is the real thing to understand for a good doctor now you i really need all your attention that clinically how a patient with cardiac tamponade present right when we talk about clinical presentation usually doctors good doctors think about back striated back striated dr back in 1930s he told that if someone has these three features you need to rule out cardiac tamponade back striated right now what is back striated let me make it here right a patient who comes with rising jugular venous pressure falling blood pressure and muffled heart sound muffled heart sounds 
और सॉफ्ट हार्ट साउंड और एबसेंट हार्ट साउंड राइट इफ अ पेशेंट कम विद राइजिंग जेवीपी फॉलिंग सिस्टेमिक आर्टीरियल ब्लड प्रेशर एंड विद मफल्ड हार्ट साउंड यू थिंक ऑफ वट कार्डियो टेम्पोनेट रिमेंबर दिस क्लासिकल प्रेजेंटेशन इज मोर कॉमन इन पेशेंट विद अक्यूट टेम्पोनेट because in acute pericardial tamponade hemodynamic stability is being lost very rapidly and these things are showing that system is patient's uh, cardiovascular system is not stable is it right now let me explain properly step by step out of these three signs of course this is a sign rising jvp changes in jvp changes in blood pressure of course i will tell you later okay let me tell you right now i will explain it in detail there is number 1 jugular vein pressure is very high number 2 pattern of jugular vein is wave form or pattern in the jugular vein is changed as i will explain in few minutes that there is yes there is lost wide descent i will explain why right there is lost y descent and there is sharp you can say sharp x descent i will explain what i really mean by this right so actually jugular venous pressure goes up with lost y descent and sharp x descent right this is the most sensitive sign of what cardiac tamponade it's the most sensitive sign of cardiac tamponade then there is falling blood pressure there is falling systemic arterial blood pressure with paradoxical pulse with paradoxical pulse or pulses paradoxes right again i will explain what is pulses paradoxes right and when you see there uh, when you hear that there are muffled heart sound usually with soft apex beat there is soft apex beat or absent apex beat right but classical features are three rising jvp falling blood pressure with muffled heart sound or soft heart sound now let me first explain jugular venous pressure in a patient with cardiac tamponade what happens to jvp stand for jugular venous pressure and jvp also stands for jugular venous pulse so when we are talking about jvp we must talk about the pressure is it normal or not and we should also talk about the pulse pattern that is normal or not right now let me explain first normal jugular venous wave form and then what happens in cardiac tamponade right so now be attentive try to understand with both ears and your hemispheres i mean cerebral hemispheres aha uh -huh. yes let me draw the jugular venous <coughs> this is normal jugular venous tracing right actually this is also central venous pressure tracing because jugular venous pressure which is here and pulse form right that reflects the ch pressure changes in the right atrium because right atrium spiro vena cava and eventually internal jugular vein there are no valves in between so because there are no valves in between right so whatever pressure changes come into right atrium right they are faithfully usually faithfully reflected in internal jugular vein pressure and wave form right let me draw here the right heart that right and here is let's suppose is i'm not going into details spiro vena cava and eventually you can say here is your what internal jugular vein now internal jugular vein you can say if there's a balloon here and there's a pointer here and there's a pointer here and it is connected with eventually with the, what is your right heart right now the changes now imagine there is a paper moving under this pointer there is a balloon here so here is your blood okay i will make the balloon color and pointer different 
just imagine there is a device which measures the pressure here now when pressure changes will occur into right atrium they will be reflected on the back so we can say internal jugular vein is a sort of manometer or hygrometer attached with the right atrium now this ball will move and pointer will move and we can get the tracing even clinically we can see is that right now what really happens imagine start with this atria contract atrial contraction when atrium contract pressure goes up so this will move little up when it will little up then tracing will go up and this is called a wave what is this a wave when atrium contracts is it right a wave is formed after that what will happen atrial systole will be terminated and what will happen wow. yes this valve will open or close atrial contraction fluid has come here after that ventricular contraction will start let me tell you at the end of the atrial systole blood has been filled into ventricle then ventricular systole will start right when ventricular systole will start this valve will close tricuspid valve will close so that blood does not go back it moves forward right now when atria were contracting pressure went up a wave is formed and when atria started relaxing pressure was going down but suddenly ventricular contraction started when ventricle contraction started this valve closed when this valve closed there is a little jerk here the ball will little bit move when this valve closed right little jerk after that atria and ventricle are not connected with each other because of the closure of the valve now whatever happened to ventricle we are not worried now we are seeing what is happening in atrium what is happening now into atrium atrium is progressively relaxing when atrium is relaxing you are understanding when atrium is relaxing of course blood will come down and pressure will come down is that right this pressure which is coming down due to atrial relaxation this pressure is called what is this x descent what is it called x descent is that right after that what happens when it was relaxed it was progressively relaxing more and more blood was coming and accumulating into this eventually a time will come that valve is still closed and atria is completely full now more venous return is coming now this more venous return which is coming and atria is no more relaxing accumulation of blood will slightly take the pressure up this pressure upward is due to venous blood accumulating here we call it v wave what we call it v wave and this jerk which came here due to closure of this valve is c wave so again let me repeat it that what really happens atrial atrial contraction a wave atria start relaxing but ventricular contraction closes the tricuspid valve and c wave then atria keep on relaxing and x descent pressure keep on going down when it become full more blood is coming and now it start flo floating upward venous accumulation v wave eventually this valve will yes will open and when this valve will open this accumulated blood will fall eventually when this valve will open when atrial diastole is still going on ventricle has completed its systole and now ventricular diastole or relaxation start and as soon as ventricular relaxation start what will happen this valve will open, open. and as soon as this valve open the accumulated blood will fall here right because when ventricle relax intraventricular pressure are very low as soon as intraventricular pressure are lower uh, become becomes lower than the intraatrial pressure ventricular filling will occur when ventricular filling will occur then what will happen that this blood which is accumulated here as this blood will go down this will again go down this ventricular filling or more appropriately atrial emptying atrial emptying immediately after valve opening or ventricular filling immediately after the valve opening takes the whole venous column down and this is presented as pressure also going down and this downward going is called y descent 
what is it called why descent right why descent occur during early diastole early diastole of ventricle immediately after opening of the tricuspid valve am i clear now we see in these patient what really happened in these patient now again i will just repeat that you can repeat with me again next atrial contraction ventricular contraction valve closure right this is valve closure then then atrial relaxation x descent and then venous accumulation and then ventricular early early diastolic ventricular filling due to opening of tricuspid valve so what is this this is again y descent this is also y descent now after this basic understanding now we come a patient with cardiac tamponade what changes in jugular venous pressure will come now we'll talk about a patient with cardiac tamponade now imagine that there's fluid accumulated here and this is your cardiac situation right stimulated and here was your what was this internal jugular venous system okay now pressure from here what will happen to these situations first of all when it is being strangulated blood will pool behind blood will accumulate here and this ball will go a higher level so total jugular i'm not talking about wave now i'm talking about the pressure suppose here was the pressure that was 3 cm above the angle of lewis or sternomenobrial joint at 45 angle right as but as tamponade start right venous blood which is coming from head and neck it cannot enter here can it doctor because it cannot enter here so blood start accumulating so this point will shift upward in the pressure scale right so first thing will happen here that jugular venous pattern will go up i'm just drawing now 